Okay, so this is week three in our series called Rooted, and we've been talking about God's Word and you spending time with Jesus, with His Word. And it matters, and some of you guys have come on this journey with us these last few weeks, and you've been doing this Rooted reading plan, and some of you guys have even journaled what you've been reading, and there's totally bonus points for journaling, by the way, amen? Total bonus points for that. Um, but you, the, the, the big point is that it's you and him, and that you're having that moment where you're opening this thing up, and you're expecting Jesus Christ to supernaturally speak into your life, amen? Amen. And some of you guys have had those moments and some of you guys have been shocked at what he has said to you. And and let me just say, it has been my prayer for you the last few weeks that Jesus would show up in your life because it can be terrifying to go into that quiet space and to open up that Bible and, and like, but what if he doesn't show? And what if he doesn't speak into my life? And it can be a struggle of faith, amen? It can be a struggle of faith. And so I've been praying that God would show up. And, and, and if you've got a story of something that God's been speaking to you, email that to me, Facebook that to me. I would love to hear that. Some of you guys already have of these steps that you're taking with Jesus. And I get excited. Okay, so we've done two weeks of this. We got today and we got one more week in this particular series before we get into the prayer series. And today feels, is going to feel a little bit like maybe a right turn um, because we were having a discussion about what it is to meet with Jesus and his word And Pastor Ricky brought up this thing. He's like, you know, what about the people who aren't quite sure if they trust God's word yet? Because we can all feel like we're coming to this church and we're all good Christians, which means we learned in Sunday school we're supposed to trust God's word. And so we don't talk about our doubts very much. But what if we do have doubts? And so today is about that. Because sometimes people have come to you or, or, or you've just seen some things yourself and you just weren't so sure about. And so we're going to dive into the doubts today. And we're going to look at the evidence that we could trust God's word. Amen? It's going to be good. Let's talk about doubt for a second. I'm going to give you two kinds of doubts. One doubt, I don't think it's such a big deal. Actually, it can be good. You can have something really good in your life. And you can let doubt come in. And sometimes doubt just gets you moving. Sometimes doubt is the instigator that gets you looking a little bit deeper into the relationship to see if it is what it says it is. And the deeper you go, the better things get. Sometimes our questions can be good questions, but sometimes our doubts can be this deeper lingering thing that we're afraid of. And we can have certain doubts and certain questions that, that we kind of we push down and we don't speak of those things because we're afraid they might lead to us no longer believing. I used to feel that way. I remember. Like, I liked Jesus. I liked God. I liked the whole Christianity thing. But I was a little bit worried that if I went too deep... I would wake up one day and discover that God was not who I thought he was. I would wake up and discover that this whole thing had an end to it. And so I didn't want to pursue those questions. Do you ever decide to not go to the doctor and get the test because you're afraid of what the test result is going to be? Amen. Amen. Right? And I think we can do that, and it makes total sense. But we can do that with God's word and we can just, just say, I'm going to stay back here at this, at this kind of distant place and I'm not going to ask the questions or let my mind go there. And, and today we're going to let our minds go there because I think it's worth going there. Because I think those lingering questions, when God wants to come in with his word and give you a rock solid promise to stand on, or he wants to change your life, or he wants to demand something of you that is for your good and for your health, sometimes we back off and we don't take it so seriously because we're not sure. And let's get rid of the not sure today. So this Bible here claims that God wrote it. It's 66 books from start to finish written by, I think, 40 different authors, three continents, three different languages, all kinds of different people, Old and New Testament. But the claim of Scripture is that God himself wrote this. And that's a miracle if that's the case. 
and we have a treasure, the result of a miracle, if that's the case, do we believe it's the case? And I would say you need faith to believe that. And you need faith not just to believe that God wrote it. I think the problem is much bigger than sometimes we give it credit for. Not only do I have to believe that God wrote the thing, but there's actually four, four things I've got to believe about the Bible. I've got to believe that God wrote it. But I've also got to believe that all of it, every single piece is connected and part of the scripture God intended me to have, not just certain parts. Some of you like the New Testament better than the Old Testament. And sometimes we, we pick parts that we know it's, it's all together. And we got to have faith that it's all together. I also need faith that God protected it down through the centuries. I got to believe that even if he originally authored it, how do I know that the version I have in my hand today is actually the right thing and it's not been polluted down through the centuries? I get to have faith. But it's not just going to be a, a choice of faith today. We're going to look at some evidence behind some of these things too because I think all the things that God asks us to believe, he gives us reasonable, reasonable evidence in order to make that choice. And then the last thing that we have to believe is that when I actually sit down with this thing, even if I believe God wrote it, even if I believe it's all good, even if I believe that he protected it down through the ages, how do I believe that he'll actually explain it to me? Because this is an ancient book, and I live in 2022. How do I know it's for me today? See, you need a lot of faith and the problem is maybe a little bit bigger than you even thought. So as we dive into this, I just want to tell you, I'm about to give you more information on this topic than you might want. And so first off, I give you my full permission to ignore me at certain points if it all just becomes too much. Amen? So take some notes. Maybe come back to some of it later. Some of you guys like to pull out the smartphone and like take a picture and like Google the thing later. Go ahead, do all the things. But I would just say this to you. Even if you've come today and you're like, you know what, this really isn't me. I do believe in the scripture and I don't have those doubts. Then praise God for that. But I would still challenge you. Maybe the Holy Spirit wants to use today to train you up and equip you for the other people in your life that will have questions. You got your friends, you got your family, some of you got kids, and you don't know the questions that are going to come to you in the coming years. And it may be that today is the day that equips you for that moment. Amen? Are you ready? Let's go. Let's go. Okay, so can I trust God wrote it originally? So this is 2 Peter 1.16, and he comes out swinging. This is the Apostle Peter. He says, For we are not making up clever stories. When we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? No, no, no. We, it's, it's not made up. We saw it. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. And because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. He's referring to the Old Testament here. He said, because we saw Jesus and everything that Jesus did, it actually made us believe the Old Testament better. And you must pay close attention to what they wrote. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place. Verse 20, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. So it starts with eyewitnesses who had their own experience. And that's big. Because that's the conviction with which they wrote. If somebody came and said, Peter, how do you know that what you're writing is actually scripture? He would be like, I met Jesus. I saw it. Massive. That's the way that it begins. But then he tells us to trust everything that's in the scripture. And he says, these kinds of scriptures, these exact prophecies, not all prophecies, by the way. There are a lot of people in the world down through the ages that made junk prophecies. Amen? So you're not talking about that. He's saying the things that are in the scripture, those are the things that are a miracle. Those are the things that God has chosen and protected. The Holy Spirit moved them. I think that's massive. One, one thing that's hard, I think sometimes we, we get this and we're like, you know, 
It's supposed to be God's word, and the Holy Spirit moved them, but a physical person actually wrote on the paper, right? Like, how do I trust that? Um, let me tell you about transcribers for, for a second here. People transcribe stuff down through the ages for certain authors. This is actually an ancient practice. Hey, do you ever have to read Paradise Lost by John Milton? Anybody ever have to read that poem, epic poem? Raise your hand just really quick. Give them a hand, would you? They put up with a lot. It's a really, really long poem, hard to read. Okay, so, so John Milton was actually blind when he wrote that. He was blind at the age of 44. It has 10,550 lines in this epic classic poem, and he never held a pen in his hand to write Paradise Lost. Instead, he got friends and family to sit down with him, and he dictated the words to them, and they wrote it on the page. Bet you didn't know that. But there is no question about the fact that John Milton wrote Paradise Lost. And there's no question in the minds of scholars about that. So we don't need to struggle with the fact that God himself could move a human individual with their own pen and write down his words on the page. You follow that today? God used human transcribers. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. I love that picture. And it's useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love that picture. It's God breathed. And this is Paul saying this. We had Peter before. We had Paul saying this now. And, and, and what you need to understand is the New Testament writers knew what scripture was. And they knew how inspired of God it was. They knew the miracle that they had in their hands. So not only did it come from God, but notice the way he's talking about it. He's like, you can use it in your daily life. Like, this isn't so ancient and far away, it's no good. It's like, no, this is useful for everything in your life. You want to walk the way of Jesus? You need a Bible. It's going to show you how to walk the way of Jesus. You want to be equipped. Anybody in here want to be equipped as a good Christian dad? Anybody want to be equipped as a Christian mom or a wife or a business leader? Anybody want to be equipped today? See, in order to be equipped, you don't need a seminary degree. You need a Bible. That's what he says right here. So next, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. Can I trust that it's all trustworthy, every single part of the scripture, that it's trustworthy? Now, I ask this question partly because a little bit of a story. My dad went, and he was, uh, he was a Marine in Vietnam, and he struggled with his faith when he was in Vietnam, and you can imagine why. He saw a lot of difficult things over there. And he confided in me, there was a story, um, he had gone to a chaplain there, and he was talking and talking about some of his struggles with his faith, and one of the things that the chaplain told him was he was like, don't worry about all that other stuff, just read the words in red. And, and if you know about Bibles from that time, see, the words would be in red, just the words that Jesus spoke. So everything else is black text, but the red text are the words exactly that Jesus spoke. And what the person tried to help him, and I kind of get where they were coming from, is just saying, just focus on the words of Jesus. And I get it. But all of the scripture is God-breathed. And it's all useful. So, I mean, Pastor Ricky talked about a buffet, going to a buffet in week one. It was like this guy told my dad, go up to the buffet and only eat from one dish. I mean, you can do that. But there's just so much more gold available to you. So we're going to talk about how you can trust it. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. He's talking about the Old Testament there. He says, no, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So Jesus affirms the Old Testament. So let me show you some other ways Jesus affirmed the Old Testament. And this one's going to break your brain just a little bit. Jesus constantly talked about the Old Testament. So look at this list of places where he talked about the Old Testament. Right? It's an eye chart, isn't it? Jesus talked about Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis as the first man and the first woman and their relationship in Mark chapter 10, 6 through 8. He referred to it not like it was a, a, a legend, 
or a myth. He talks about it as if it was real. Cain and Abel and their murder, Jesus refers to that in Luke chapter 11. Noah and the flood, he talked about Abraham. He talked about Lot's wife. He talked about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He talked about Isaac and Jacob, Moses and the Ten Commandments, manna in the desert, which we talked about last week, King David in 1 Samuel, even Jonah in the belly of the fish for three days. Jesus talks about it as if the stories were true. Why does that matter? It matters because sometimes we like to pick and choose out of the scripture. We're like, we really like what Jesus had to say. He was a wonderful moral teacher, but nobody was in the belly of a fish for three days. You don't get Jesus without Jonah. Because Jesus said it's true. Jesus affirms all of scripture. It's, it's amazing to me. So there's 66 books in your total Bible. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. Out of the 39 books in the Old Testament, I don't have time to show it to you today, but 24 of them are quoted directly by Jesus in his teachings. It is as if Jesus treated the Old Testament like it was his Bible, because it was his Bible. He treated it like it was God's word. So now let's look at the New Testament. So the apostles knew that they were writing the Bible. Look at this, 2 Peter 3.15. Peter says, you you can't overestimate or or, um, overappreciate how important Peter was in the first century church. He was the top apostle. Okay, he, he, had, he had the authority, he was it. So as the new church is starting, as it's spreading across the ancient world, turning the ancient world upside down, they're planting all these churches, Peter's word was it. Look at what he says. He says, remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved, which is a cool truth. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him, speaking of these things in all of his letters. So Peter comes and says, I know some of you guys have gotten letters, books from Paul, and he's about to affirm them. Some of his comments are hard to understand. Ever read the book of Romans? It can be hard to understand. That's Paul. Hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do the other parts of Scripture. And this will result in their destruction. Where he says, just as they do the other parts of Scripture, that's massive for your understanding of this book. Because Peter, in that moment, he takes everything that Paul wrote, puts it together, and says, this stuff is scripture. And they're trying to twist this stuff like they do the other scriptures. He lumps it in. So now you got Peter affirming that New Testament books are Bible. And Peter's works are Bible. And then even more mind-blowing is the fact that these these people taking the movement of Jesus forward with the limited knowledge that they had, they knew they were writing the scripture. So people will come along and they will say, you know what, the, the disciples, they had no idea that this is where this was all going to go. They had no idea that people were gonna take their words so seriously. Oh, yes, they did. He's using the same word for scripture as they used for the Old Testament. And he's affirming, we know exactly what's going on right now and we are writing the Bible. So you got Jesus affirming the Old Testament and you got the New Testament authors affirming each other and knowing exactly what they're about. So now let's leap into the next section. Can I trust that the Bible was handed down to me correctly? So people will ask this question Um, they'll say, you know, we got stories in here, but they're only in here, right? I don't know that archaeology actually proves or affirms any of it. So I'm going to go after that with you right now. I'm just going to give you some examples. And man, this is a, this is, I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole pretty far on this if you start Googling this stuff. There's a whole lot of great stuff out there. So I'm just going to give you a smattering. These are archaeological finds that affirm stuff in your Bible. The very first one is the Tel Dan inscription. And this is an ancient inscription in stone 
where another nation at 900 BC, that's not when it was found, that's when it was etched in stone, but it's in a museum today. And it actually refers from this other nation, a different language, it refers to the house of David, which is the dynasty of King David in the Old Testament. So that's affirmed there. You've got the Moabite stone that in 2 Kings 3 talked about all these different battles between the Moabites and the Israelites. And detail about those battles is on the Moabite stone in a museum today. You've got the Lakish pottery. You can see that little picture there on the side. Those are all those broken pieces of pottery. You see the writing on them? That's the Lakish pottery. So it was a, a custom in the, um, in the ancient world where broken pots, they would take the shards if they were large enough and they would inscribe uh, messages to each other and even detail histories that they would give to each other. And on some of this lakish pottery that's been rediscovered, it describes in detail Nebuchadnezzar's attack on Jerusalem. Wild. Just affirms it. So the next one. I'm just going to fly through that. That's the Shiloh inscription right there. Um, so the stone tablets of Gilgamesh are one of the most exciting ones to me. They actually, it actually retells the story of Noah's flood in a different language from a different nation. I believe that's the Assyrians. And what you kind of, your imagination has kind of got to do is this idea of um, if, if Noah and the story of the flood and his ark is actually true, then all people were killed except Noah's family. And so Noah and his wife became like the new Adam and Eve, and they came and they repopulated the earth from that spot, which means the story of the flood was probably verbally handed down from generation to generation to generation. So everybody for a while, for a certain number of generations, would have had their own story of the flood. Maybe not in detail, exactly like you would see it in your scripture. But it's affirmed there from a whole other nation. The discovery, of, or sorry, the Shiloh inscription. That's a funny one. Um, so there was a time when in Jerusalem, King Hezekiah, he was under siege and they had no water inside of Jerusalem. And so he, he uh, had this tunnel created that started at a water source and brought water underneath, uh, underground um, into the city center. And he started some diggers on, on one end, started some diggers on the other, and they were supposed to meet in the middle. And it's this whole huge thing and kind of mirror and it's described in the Old Testament. And for a long time, scholars are like, no, no, it doesn't exist until a water pipe broke and they went down to fix it and they discovered Hezekiah's tunnel. And in the middle of the tunnel is that inscription right there that you see a picture of and it describes the two sets of diggers and how they met in the, the middle and Hezekiah and the whole thing. And it affirms the biblical story. And this stuff goes on and on, the Pool of Siloam. It goes on and on and on. There are archaeological digs that would blow your mind, affirming all kinds of things from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Abraham's home city of Ur, there's an archaeological dig there. Nineveh, Jericho, and its walls that came a fallen down. Solomon's cities of Hazor, Megiddo, Gezer. So much. And you can, you can check all this stuff out. It's fun. Anybody having fun? It's fun stuff. And, and, and again, it's like, it's like a rabbit hole. I'm not saying you want to spend your life here. But it's fun to know that this is not a set of myths created by one group of people. But the entire ancient world brings evidence to the table to validate it. And why didn't all that evidence just get destroyed along the way? Do you see the supernatural hand of God coming in and protecting all these things? things in museums today so that we can know, we can have confirmation and evidence that makes our faith reasonable. That's important stuff. Even, even Jesus in the New Testament, Josephus was somebody who wrote about Jesus even though he was a Jewish historian and not part of the Christian faith, even a little bit hostile. But he talked about the fact that Jesus was a historical person, that he died by crucifixion, that he stood before Pontius Pilate. He describes the entire thing. Tacitus is a Roman person who described the early church, again, with hostility in his words, describes this movement that had started and turned the ancient world upside down. Even Pliny the Younger as well. They're all, Google all this stuff. It's all out there. Okay, next question um, when, when we talk about like, can we trust that it's been handed to us right? Um, one of the things people will ask you is, is this a copy of copy of copy of copies? 
right? Like, like 2,000 years ago, somebody wrote this particular book, right? And, and the way the saying goes is, that was handed to somebody else, a scribe, to make a copy 50 years later. And then another 50 years later, somebody else copied it. And every single time it got copied, more and more errors were introduced into the scripture that you have today. So it's like the telephone game with your Bible. And so what you have today is kind of trash. It's kind of junk. And you can't trust it. That's the way the saying goes. Not true. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about manuscripts in the ancient world. That's a boring title, isn't it? Manuscripts in the ancient world. And when I say manuscript, what I mean is an ancient document, some of them were written by the authors themselves. So let's, let's look at two rules scholars apply to ancient manuscripts to say whether or not we can trust them. Number one, they look at the date of the original writing by the original author, and then they look at a manuscript and how much time passed in between them. And if it's a lot of time, then they say errors might have come in or even legend stuff came in. The second thing that they look at is they look at how many copies, how many manuscripts from the ancient world do we have of a particular document? And if all of those things agree, if there's great agreement, we can feel pretty good about the fact that we're reading what they read back then. Making sense? So let's look at the second most attested set of manuscripts. This is for the Iliad epic poem by Homer. Some of you guys had to read this one in school as well, right? Some of you are like, yeah, it was terrible, right? But I got through it. So the Iliad by Homer. Um, we believe it was written in 900 BC. The earliest manuscript that we have is 400 BC, 500 years after it was penned by Homer. That's a lot of time, right? You following this? Okay, next, we have 643 ancient copies of the Iliad, and they agree 95% of the words. That's pretty good. It's second best, though. You might know where this is starting to head. It's second best. Okay, the next one, let's, let's look at the New Testament and let's start looking at individual manuscripts in the New Testament. And I promise this is going to be fast. I really am going to move through this fast. Um, the very first one is the John Rylands fragment, and it's in a, a museum today. And this, this fragment, front and back, has very few words on it. It describes one scene, and the scene is between Pilate and Jesus when Jesus is about to be crucified, okay? And, and in the conversation, Pilate says things like, Jesus, hey, what is truth? And he says, are you the king of the Jews? And, and you know I could crucify you. And Jesus says, you couldn't crucify me unless God the Father said it was okay. And all of that stuff happens in that little conversation. It's all on that fragment. Well, the apostle John wrote it in 95 AD, 60 years after Jesus' resurrection. The manuscript, the earliest manuscript that we've got, John Ryland's fragment, 125 AD. It's only 30 years from the original. That beats the Iliad by 450 years. Something like that. Amazing stuff. Let's look at a few more manuscripts. And again, this is, this is just a fun thing to all get into. Four more manuscripts. The Bodmer Papyrus uh, 2, which is 150 AD. The entire Gospel of John is in that fragment. That's how old that is. The, the Diatessaron, I'm trying to pronounce these things, 170 AD. All four Gospels are in a museum that old, all of it. The A. Chester Beatty. 200 AD, it's got all the Gospels, got Acts, nine of the Epistles, and the Book of Revelation, and then 400 AD, the Codex Alexandrinus of the whole Bible. Next slide. We now have 5,686 ancient Greek manuscripts in existence today, in museums today. And they are 99.5% accurate to each other. 24,000 total New Testament manuscripts, even in other languages, because it was making such an impact in the ancient world. All kinds of different languages were translating the Bible at that time. So we've got, we've got them in all different kinds of languages as well, and then 66,000 total manuscripts of Old and New Testament. So even that 0.5%, you might be wondering about that 0.5%, there are books that you can get a hold of that look at the differences in those ancient manuscripts, and they will show you that none of our doctrine, at least none of our key doctrine, hinges on any of that disagreement. 
Your Bible is solid. And I don't have time today to talk about fulfilled prophecy from the Old Testament to Jesus. I don't have time today to talk about the scientific evidence that backs up scriptural ideas. I don't have time to talk about the 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus after the tomb come out alive and absolutely believed this was all true. I don't have time to talk about any of that. Biggest thing I don't have time to talk about is the fact that you know people and might be yourself and you saw the power of Jesus come in and change your life. And that's the biggest evidence that you have is you can tell me all the school book stuff, but I know what happened to me. And that's what's got you here today. If you want to learn more about this, we preached a series called It Is Written back in 2019, kind of mid-2019, and we went even deeper on some of these topics. Go check that out. The next big question is, can I trust that this ancient book even if, even if God protected it all down through the ages, and I got it today, how do I know that this thing isn't so outdated that it can't possibly speak into anything in my life? Or that I could even understand it? So, this is John 14. John 14, 26. Jesus says, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, I don't think I've got a slide for this one, sorry about that. Jesus said, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he is the one who will teach you and remind you of everything that I have told you. So the position of the scripture is that you need the Holy Spirit to understand this book. So it was a miracle when it was written. It was a miracle when it was held together. It was a miracle when it was protected down through the ages. And it's a miracle for you to read it today. Because you've all heard the stories about people taking certain passages in this book and misreading them and leading other people astray. You need God himself to say, this is what the words mean into your life and to make certain things pop and say, this is your word for today. And this is the journey that we're all on right now. But I just want to acknowledge that by faith, we pick up that book. Amen? Amen. 1 Peter 1, 24 says the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever, forever. Grass withers, flowers fade. The self-help books at Walmart <laughs> wither and fade, do they not? Self-help that's no help at all. All the little Wisdom posts circling around on Facebook and Instagram, they wither and they fade. We're swimming in stuff that claims to be wisdom and is not wisdom. We're swimming in stuff that claims to heal us and it doesn't heal us at all. And, and, and it's, it's barely better than a fad, most of this stuff. Even, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they're like, I saw a post on Facebook, and they claimed that it was Scripture, and then I went, went and looked it up because it was so crazy to me, and it wasn't in Scripture at all. People are deep faking the Bible, for heaven's sake. Grass withers, flower fades. Where the Lord stands forever, down through the ages. Jesus says, it'll never pass away. God protects it. It's rock solid. Why? Because you need it to be rock solid. This is not optional stuff. If we don't have this, what do we have? This right here. This is a precious item to me. This is my grandfather's Bible. I was checking the print date. It's 110 years old. If you could see the pages, you could see how tissue paper they are, how worn down everything is. And my mom and my uncle gave this to me to keep safe. And uh, my grandfather fought in the European theater in World War II. They think that he took this Bible with him and brought it back. We've got a journal that he took and brought back. I get entries from him. I've got pictures that he took overseas and brought back. And, and he was army and he fought Hitler. 
and he had this Bible maybe with him. But I was looking at it, and one of the things I noticed is buried in here, there's this little little piece of paper, and it says it's typed, right? On a typewriter, actually. It says Deuteronomy 32, 35 through 43. And I took a picture of it so you could see up close, but that's it right there. It says, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. And you can see he marked that in blue in his Bible, that whole passage. And it's interesting to me, because this, this verse is basically saying, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Some of you guys know it in that way. God is saying, you don't have to get revenge yourself, even though you might be tempted to. You don't have to get caught up. You don't have to wonder in a world full of injustice and tyrants like Hitler was. You don't have to wonder how all the rights or how all the wrongs are going to be righted, how all the scores are going to be settled. God says, I got it. He says, it belongs to me. So now I want you to imagine a young soldier has got that marked in his Bible and he gets on a boat and goes over to Germany. I like that that's in his heart. I like that that restfulness, that trust in God, that teaching that he shouldn't take things into his own hands and get too worked up. Can you see how that would guide somebody through a war? I can. See, some of these verses, that's, that's the whole thing, okay? We, we can talk about this hypothetically, and we talk about the science and stuff like that. But these verses are not hypothetical. We depend on them. They change our lives. God's word changes our lives. See, you got verses in there. You got verses in here. That they're not optional for you. If you didn't have those, you don't know what you would do without them. Right, like you got to have that scripture because I built a life on it. Have you got verses like that? Because I do, and I need them. Can I give you one? I'll give you one. Psalm 103, watch this. It says, he has removed our sins as far, as, as far from us as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? Infinity. That's how far he removed your sins from you. You don't have to hold on to your shame. You don't have to hold on to your past. It's not right there. God isn't waiting for you to do penance and keep asking him his forgiveness over and over and over again for what you did 15 years ago. No, he's removed it. So you know a verse like that. You build your life on a verse like that. And all of a sudden you're free in his grace. All of a sudden you know his love. Next verse, John 8, 7. They kept demanding an answer. And so Jesus stood up and said, Okay, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and he wrote in the dust. Some of you guys, this passage right here changed your life. The mercy he had on this woman. She wasn't innocent. She was guilty. But the Lord of glory didn't come to judge her. He came to protect her and to save her. And when all these religious people, because don't, don't the religious people always do this? They were all ready to come in and say, no, nah, no, nah, she's bad and we're good. And Jesus is like, no, none of you get to cast a stone. Go, Jesus. Let's go. Right? Here's another one. Luke 15, verse 20. And while he was a still long way off, his father saw him coming. Do you know where this is going? And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said, oh, father, you just don't know. I've sinned so bad. I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. You ever make this speech to God? Look at what he says. But his father said to the servants, no, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him because I'm going to treat him like a full son on day one. That's how forgiven he is. I love him, ran to him, waiting on the porch for him to come back home. See, these verses aren't hypothetical. 
They're things that we need. If you took just any of them away, what would we do? I got a few more. Luke 23, the thief on the cross said, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? (laughs) And shockingly, Jesus isn't like, I'm kind of busy saving the world over here. You don't know what kind of pain I'm going through. I can't think about your need. No, Jesus Jesus doesn't say you're going to have to go to purgatory because you're kind of a bad guy. No, he doesn't say today. I assure you today you'll be with me in paradise. Romans 8, 38 says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Is that good news today? What would you do without this verse? Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate you and me from God's love. Amen? What would you do without that verse? Revelation 21, 4, talking about heaven, and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Would you guys stand? Are you thankful that you can trust this book? I am. Let's pray. We're God. Jesus, I pray that some of this information, Lord, would maybe be helpful to us and that, God, maybe you're settling doubts in our hearts right now. Maybe some of us, we got just enough that we know that we've got to go research further. God, I pray that we would. But help the light bulbs to come on for us, God. We don't want these We don't want these slow, draining doubts in our walk with you. Set us free. Set us free to believe you. Set us free to hear from you, Jesus. Come and change us. Christ's name, amen.